Okay, so welcome again, everyone. Welcome to this um, fourth panel of the Loser American Education Foundation Conference, a little bit different of a conference that has been done for uh, the last four and a half uh, decades. Uh, most of you weren't born, um, but some of us were. Uh, and so um, when the first Loser American Education Foundation Conference began, Welcome to those of you who are following us uh, on the webinar. Thanks to all of you who are uh, joining in as uh, attendees. We appreciate uh, your presence. And uh, remember, if you have any questions anytime throughout the event, please just uh, type them in on the chat. We can all see them then as panelists. Um, welcome to those who are following us on Televisão Portuguesa de Califórnia. João Manuel Dias, thanks for live streaming the event. And welcome to those of you who are, face who are with us on Facebook Live. So we are going to uh, welcome everyone and uh, we'll take some time to introduce ourselves. I won't be doing the introductions. Uh, our distinctive panelists will do, be doing that. And we will also start uh, with a message uh, from a board member of the Luso American Education Foundation. Uh, yesterday we began with the president of the Luso American Education Foundation, Bernice Polikish. And today, there they are, Brittany and Brianna, how are you? Uh, and today we will uh, we will start with uh, the chairman of the board of the Luso American Education Foundation. He is Moses himself uh, because he was here when it all began. Just like uh, in, uh, in 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 religious terms, it was Moses that began uh, the journey that most of us uh, are part of. And so um, we thank uh, the Eduardo Zebu for being here. And uh, on behalf of the Luso American Education Foundation, he'll give us a few words. I also want to mention that the uh, conference is uh, hosted by the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute, something we started about a year and a half ago at Fresno State. Um, it was going to be present at Fresno State uh, up until the pandemic hit. And then also we want to thank our sponsors, the Luso American Development Foundation, Flat from Lisbon, the government of the Azores, uh, Luso Life, and of course, João Manuel Dias and Televisão Portuguesa de Califórnia. Eduardo. Well, thank you. Thank you, Denise. Uh, and welcome everyone, the panels in particular, and everyone watching us. Um, good evening, uh, good afternoon, or good morning. We may have uh, our friend Miguel listening and watching us in Portugal at this time, and others in the Azores. Uh, you know, by the time this conference is over, Denise will make me about 300 years old. You know, every, every, every time he introduces me, I'm either Moses or Christ, so, but whatever. Thank you, Denise, appreciate it. Uh, this, uh, today's uh, uh, panel is going to discuss <clears throat> a very important topic, which is the folklore, music, and theater. And talking about the Portuguese popular experience in California, uh, they have provided us and will continue to provide with a lot of excitement and make our experience in California a much better one. Um, needless to say, uh, this is our 44th conference. Every year we do one and we started in 1977. So we want to continue the tradition. And this year we almost uh, did not do it uh, because of the pandemic. And of course we put our resources together, our thinking together in particular, Dindish Borges, and he came up with the idea of doing this in Zoom. I believe that back in March, Few of us even knew what Zoom was. We had an idea. We had no idea that we could do a conference of this nature. So far as we're is doing well, and I am particularly interested in uh, continuing to do more of these uh, uh, encounters doing Zoom. It certainly is convenient, uh, but there is something that we miss. And that is to put your arms around each other and the warmth that comes from meeting in person and knowing and uh, challenge our, uh, <clears throat> our thoughts in person. Nevertheless, it's the best we can do. Uh, welcome, uh, let's have a good evening uh, and let's listen to what everyone has to say. Okay, I'll see you later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eduardo. And uh, again, thanks to all of the panelists and thanks uh, to the Luz American Education Foundation uh, board members uh, for believing that we could actually do this uh, virtually. So we do not have a year, a blank year uh, in this tradition for the Luz American Education Foundation. So um, I'd like to take a couple of minutes um, to about three to four minutes 
if uh, you'll introduce yourself and your involvement in the community um, within the uh, three segments that we are trying to concentrate uh, today, as Eduardo Zebu said, which is folklore, the philharmonicas, the marching bands, and the carnaval. Um, and uh, there are folks who are following us in different parts and may not know uh, the tradition of carnaval in California is based basically on the Terceira Island Carnaval, uh, which has been adapted by, by all Portuguese, whether you're from Terceira or Pico or from Fayal or from mainland Portugal, it, is, um, it has been celebrated in the theater style of the dances and bailinhos in California, particularly uh, with, uh, with lots of participation, I would say particularly in the last 35 years or to 40 years or so. And so uh, that's what we're gonna concentrate on. Uh, everyone in the panel has an experience in one, two, and some people in all three of these. So uh, tell us a little bit uh, about yourself, uh, introduce yourself, uh, and um, your involvement in the community in the realm of folklore, marching bands, and carnaval. And I cannot have a better person to start with this than with the Fadista, uh, who can also throw in that other part, and that is David Garcia. Mr. Dinesh, thank you. Uh, yes, like you said, I'm David Garcia. I've been involved in all three and then some of the cultural aspect within our community. Uh, I began playing in the Portuguese band of San Jose uh, when I was 13 years old and I played in the band for 14 years. Uh, I was involved and still am involved in Carnaval and have been for about 20 years now, which I was just doing the math and that's scary. Um, and then I've also been in folklore for about 16, 17 years now. And I've done those all three at the same time uh, at one point. It's not easy. I loved it, but I had to cut back a little bit so I can have a personal life. And um, yeah, everything is good in moderation. And at one point it was a little overwhelming, but um, yeah. And right now um, for the last 10 years, I've been singing Fadu. So that has also helped to have for me to minimize my involvement in, in the other aspects of the, of the culture, but still pretty active within the community. Thank you, Rosie. Hi, my name is Rosie Soros. I am first generation Portuguese uh, immigrant who came to this lovely place um, from the lovely island of San Jorge. I do not speak Portuguese. However, with the pandemic, I have taken the advantage of learning the language uh, still very, very horrible at it, but, you know, bear with me. Um, although I don't speak the language, my heart is truly knee deep into the culture and the traditions. I have been a part of two different bands within San Jose, Nova Alianza and UP, Union Popular, as well as Demstu Torora, a folklore group for roughly 10 years. Um, I also help out at our Five Wounds Portuguese National Church as the catechist teacher. Fantastic. Thank you. And uh, uh, Evelyn. Hi, my name is Evelyn Madruga Barandiran. I am here today representing the Portuguese American Dancers of San Diego. Um, we are a folklore dance group that was established in 1948. I did not dance back in those times, but. <laughs> Um, I did begin dancing in about 1970. Um, I am very retired. Um, our group tends to be a little bit of a younger crowd. Um, we have two folklore dance groups. Um, range, the first group is our junior group, ranging from the ages of five to 12 years old. And then anybody over 12 to 30 something is in our adult group. But um, I also am, knee deep into our cultures, um, our Portuguese culture here in San Diego. Um, I sit on the board for the Portuguese Historical Center and volunteer a lot at our local hall and also am a catechist at St. Agnes Church. Thank you, Evelyn. Joseph, you're unmute yourself. You're on mute, Joseph. There we go. And, and, and explain to you and explain to all of us who don't know uh, what you're wearing. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I, I need to apologize for not unmuting myself. I should know how to do this. I do this every day for work <laughs> with about 140 Portuguese students. So I'm disappointed that I forgot to unmute myself right there. 
Uh, but anyway, um, well, my name is Joseph Souza, and I am from Turtle Rock, California. I currently live in Hillmar, but whatever, the two towns are kind of the same. Um, what I'm wearing is a the the typical shirt of a northern northwestern folklore outfit for um, for guys, uh, northwestern Portugal. I'm still uh, dance in a folklore group, uh, Group Folklorico Mar Alto. I've been in the group for about 30 years now. Um, I'm no longer one of the leaders, one of the, well, I guess I'm kind of one of the directors, one of the choreographers, but I'm no longer the director of the group, which is good. Um, and uh, I also play in a Portuguese dance band called Saint Dubida, uh, which I absolutely love. Um, I've been in a couple of other bands over the years, Macacada and Horizonte, a couple other bands that I used to play with. Um, I am also very involved in Portuguese culture stuff at Our Lady of the Assumption Portuguese Catholic Church in Turlock. Um, they do a lot of stuff. They, as we, many of you know, they have a few festas a year that they host. Um, the biggest one being the festa of Our Lady of the Assumption in August, um, which this year we still had the religious part of the festa, but of course all of the cultural parts were canceled due to COVID. Um, so I, I, I read and alter serve at the Portuguese mass there. Um, I play guitar for the catechism mass for the kids um, and things like that. So, um, and kind of all I've done um, off and on over the years, um, probably done it about 10 or 12 times. I don't know, but kind of scattered throughout like a couple of years here, a couple of years there as groups around me pop up and invite me to be part of it. Um, probably like, yeah, between 10 and 15 uh, times that I've performed with that. I think that's it. Thank you, Joseph. Let's tell you. To make sure I unmuted myself. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Natalia Rosa. I am to the daughter of an immigrant father from Fayal and the granddaughter of immigrant parents from Lisboa. My mother was born here. Um, and I am part of and representing Ranch Folklorico Portuguesa based out of Newark, California. Um, our dance group was founded uh, back in 1991 by my mother, Linda Simões. Rosa, my uncle, Adrian Simões, and my avô, Almerim Simões. Um, very proud to say that we were the first Ribatej group or group that represented the region of the Ribatej um, here in California. Um, so, uh, so I'd like to say that I've been a part of it since I was born, uh, but really only dancing since I was about 10 years old. So the last 20 or so years. Although I've had some moderate involvement in the Sashkanaval and other aspects of the Portuguese community, I wouldn't say that I'm as well versed in them as I am um, specifically in folklore and specifically in the region of the Ribatej due to the dance group that I've been a part of forever. That's a little bit about me. Fantastic. Thank you, Natalia. Abel. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me again, Sio Nish. Uh, my name is Abel Dutra. I am also a son of immigrants from the beautiful island of Tuseta. Um, As many of the immigrants that immigrated back in those 70s, my parents kind of congregated here in the city of Chino and really kept myself and my sisters involved in the community at, at a young age. I learned how to play the music uh, at the age of seven, eight. It was taught by my godfather, uh, Tony Dutra, and uh, started playing the Philharmonic at the age of 10. Uh, from there, uh, age 14, 15, I started uh, dancing for the folklore group here, uh, Cultural Portuguese uh, Tshin. I've had uh, the honor of being a part of that group for many years, on and off. Uh, uh, start off as a dancer. I currently help out on the vocal section. And I've also been an active um, member of carnival groups for many years throughout the community. Like David Garcia, I've you know involved in a lot of aspects of the community. It's a, it's a passion of, of mine. And it, for me, it's been my way of School, Portuguese language school, um, being so involved in the, in the community has allowed me the opportunity to to read, write uh, in the language and do my part to to carry uh, to teach the other generations and do my part to continue those traditions in our community. Thank you, Abel. Tony. Tony Nunes. Can you hear me, Tony? I'm trying. Here we are. Oh, there we are. Good. All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Tony Nunes, uh, born and raised here in uh, Tulare, um, son of uh, immigrants from the Ilha Terceira. Uh, my mother was born in uh, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and uh, my father in Biscoche, um, immigrated 
sued Tulare and they lived their whole lives here. And I am following suit, uh, born and raised in Tulare. Um, at a very young age, uh, about 12 years old, I became very interested in Carnival. Um, I believe the first time I stepped on stage in Carnival was 1983. Um, Philharmonica, uh, about the age of 13, I, I've been a member for, for quite a few years, took a few years off um, here and there, uh, but um, been around the band in, in various facets as a musician, as a musical director, as a secretary, as president uh, from 2012 to 14. Um, had a brief stint with the uh, folklore group here in Tulare, Soldado Brav. I believe I had two performances. Um, folklore just isn't my thing. Uh, my wife wanted to give it a try, um, and, and I did because she supported me in everything that I've done. Um, gave it a try and short-lived, but uh, I, I enjoy watching folklore. How's that? Uh, been involved in plotting this athletic club, the soccer team here in Tulare. I played uh, as a uh, junior member, as an adult member, as a senior member, uh, do some coaching throughout the years. Actually, I'm doing some coaching with them now as well. Uh, been involved in a lot of uh, a lot of festas, a lot of things in our community. I've been a DJ here locally since 1988. Um, so yeah, I've been around the, the Portuguese community in Tulare a while. Indeed. Thank you, Tony. Luis. Uh, hi, my name is Luis Bill. Um, <clears throat> I'm the current director of the group Folklore Sudad Brav here in Tulare. Um, in fact, I was director when Tony was in the group. I like to think I wasn't the reason he quit, hopefully. Um, so I've been involved uh, with the group and uh, for about 15 years now. Uh, <clears throat> I've been involved with uh, the Fila Monica as well. Uh, group Grunewald Tulad for about the same time. Um, I've been involved with a lot of other kind of smaller groups and other kind of musical groups throughout the years. Uh, and currently teaching folklore as kind of an elective for the Portuguese school here in Tulare for the K through eighth. Um, so that's a highlight. Um, and then I'm also one third of a uh, Portuguese American podcast that uh, called Cala Boca, which we do the opposite of that. Uh, we talk about our kind of Portuguese, our experiences with the Portuguese world um, in various uh, fashions. And in fact, a few of the panelists on here uh, have been on the show. So good to see everybody. Um, and that's, that's me. Fantastic. You're a pretty tough teacher, so it might have been the reason that uh, Tony quits. I, I, <laughs> I can tell that from say. some I of the kids. It. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Luis. And, uh, and there they are, Brittany and Brianna. Hi, how are you? Thank you for inviting us. I'm Brianna vargas Coya, and I'm expecting my baby girl very soon in October, so it's really nice that she's here uh, with all of us as well, technically. <laughs> um, and uh, so our family is from Trisheda and Fial. And I am Brittany vargas Coya. People may be wondering, we are sisters and we also married brothers. That's why we still have the same last name, <laughs> not planned. Um, but I am also expecting my baby boy in December. Uh, and like Brianna mentioned, <laughs> our parents are from uh, Trisada and Fayal and our husbands are from Fayal. Um, I guess I'll take over on what we've been a part of since the age of two. We started a Grupo de Carnaval uh, in, in San Jose, Cultural Português de San Jose. And I am now 26 and Brianna- I'm 25. <laughs> And uh, we played briefly in the band of Santa Clara when we were really young. Um, and then we moved to the Portuguese band of Newark. And at one point we were doing all three uh, with school and we were just briefly part of Vida Vidal in Newark, um, which is a folklore group um, briefly. And then lastly now, uh, well, I guess what we're most passionate about, which is Carnaval. And that's what we've loved since we were young. We've done it all. We've played music in Carnaval. We've danced, obviously, and we've acted. We loved acting together. And um, I guess our favorite part was performing in Tercera uh, for Carnaval 2019. And we've had our own group, which was um, uh, Bailing dos Vargas, but it was in honor of our two friends, Michael and Andrew. Uh, which is why we originated the group and we continued on with us representing in Trisera. And then um, obviously we got married and we're doing our doctorate degrees in law and medicine. So that took a little bit of a break, but we were happy to do it in a year 
um, and then performance state of which is what we've always wanted to do our entire lives. And, um, and then uh, we both went to Santa Clara University where we made um, the Portuguese American Student Union there and that's still thriving there. Um, I mean, now with the virus, it's kind of a little different now, but that's uh, where we had um, our student union there and where we got a lot of uh, Portuguese uh, students there. A lot of people um, didn't know that there was a lot of Portuguese uh, first generation students there. So that was a great place for a lot of people to be involved in. And that's probably basically it now about us. Uh, we're just excited for our babies to be born and then to be putting them in all the stuff that we were in. <laughs> Thank you. Uh oh, did we lose Denise? I think we did. What 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 happened? What happens when you lose the host? I, I don't know. <laughs> I got a notification that Bernika is now our host. Congratulations! Yeah, I saw that too. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, you're a DJ. You can do it, right? There's no turntables on my laptop, but hey, we can figure it out. <laughs> so what happened to Denise? Did he, uh, did he take a break? <laughs> he was, I think he was playing with something and he got disconnected. And he got disconnected? Uh -oh. He was looking I at think, his computer, so I think that's what he was doing. Well, I think so our we, intros were, were too we long. We were introducing each other at the table. Who's <laughs> left? I was. <laughs> I say we hijack it, don't let him back in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what else you guys want to talk about? <laughs> I, I think we're still live, though. Yeah, live on Facebook. Yeah, well, we're we're on the Zoom. We know that. Otherwise, we would it's not funny. be uh, talking to each other. <laughs> um, anyway, <laughs> let's see. We have a viola, all right? Uh, we have. Uh, oh yeah, let's have some music. You have a Felicia. We have All David right. and others, so I suppose we can start our own show. Let me grab my trombone. <laughs> uh, trombone and viola the All right, all right, let's hear it. <laughs> Must be coming on. <laughs> oh, there you go, Sierra Duarte. Now you got a nice, well, a nice background. It, see? No. Oh, there you <laughs> go. Nothing. How many backgrounds do you have, Eduardo? Oh, I have as About many as I can. You know, I, 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 I get, I get myself bored easily, so I need to, uh, <laughs> I need to do something. Not from oh, listening you know, we'll to learn you, though. From this. Next time we have to have a backup in case something like well, this happens. Well, I, I when when Mr. Sousa went, I, I would put the guitar and so forth, but I don't <laughs> have one for everybody. Um, with my students, I uh, I still sing the happy birthday song in Portuguese for the uh, for people you know as as students are are having their birthdays, and I got to be honest, uh, trying to sing or do anything musical via Zoom. I've told my students a few times it's it's the worst thing that we do on Zoom because you can't follow the timing with the the internet connection, and so I still do it to sing happy birthday to them, and I have the students repeat after me in Portuguese, but. Uh, but I'm sure musically it doesn't come out right to the to the poor birth, birthday boy or girl. Uh, in the uh, in the chat, somebody okay. So Louise already answered the question. So everybody's already uh, introduced themselves, right? I think everybody's already introduced themselves. Yes. Okay. You know, unfortunately, I do not have the. Uh... I do not have the questions that were sent to you by the Anish, otherwise I would, I would have followed that. Uh, Bernice, do you have those though? No. No. Yeah. Yeah, he kept that to himself. Um, if you, I mean, if you want, it was it was three questions that I got emailed. I can read them to you if you if you want. Okay. I have them here. Yeah, go like that. I have them too. Okay. So the so first why thing. Why don't you ask the first question, and then everyone will answer that. Yeah. Okay, uh, Bernice, you're gonna do it. I don't have the questions. Oh, you don't? Oh, no. no. Okay. All righty. So the first question we already all did was basically introduce yourselves. 
Yeah. And then the second one was, um, how has the pandemic affected your groups and what has been done since the pandemic in your groups? So who's first? So it's a two-part yeah. question. Should we do the same order that we did last time where, I, David, you started, right? Sounds good. Sure. So I'm part of uh, Tim Sotorada, and basically our last time we had practice was in March, and we've done absolutely nothing since March. <laughs> to be honest. Uh, yeah. yeah. There's really nothing much you can do. Rosie uh, is one of our directors as well. Uh, with a group like that, you're dancing, you're singing, you're really up close and personal. There, there's no getting around that. So unfortunately, the only thing we've been doing to keep our ties together is sharing old posts on Facebook within our group, making sure contact is still there and alive within the group. Um, but as far as any other activities, nothing's been done. Same has been said for the bands. Even though I'm not part of the band, I don't play anymore. Uh, nothing's been, been going on with the band. Uh, and as far as Kevin Naval, that's been an interesting uh, subject because we have started talking about Kevin Naval um, and r r running around with the idea of doing something virtual, um, which completely contradicts what happened last year when we were anti-virtual. So uh, I don't, I, I personally, I don't know what's going to develop from Kevin Naval. I know from my group, uh, we're not going to be doing anything again this year. We don't want to risk it. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of time. And we don't want to throw that in there with, with running the risk of us not being able to perform because essentially, you know, things might get a little worse within flu season and halls won't, won't have the authority to be able to open. And so we're also not, you know, leaning towards performing virtually because the kind of all has to have an audience. We feed off of that. And so doing it virtually, no, that doesn't work. So that's where we Essentially, you're saying for next year, Carnival is already canceled or in, in the process. Uh, it's not official. It's not official, at least for us. I'm okay. sure in Shida, they're definitely going to do it. For yeah. here, um, because of state laws and stuff like that and yeah. hall capacities, I, I highly doubt that will happen. Uh, I wouldn't put it, put it past some groups to do something and do it virtually. Yeah. But from my personal group, no, we're not doing anything. Okay, thank you. Going by the list over here, about Natalia. Natalia. Okay, hi. Um, so about, so fortunately and unfortunately, our group has kind of been dormant for the past couple of years. Um, so as far as how the pandemic has affected it, affected us, um, it hasn't really, but I can only imagine how it's affecting other groups and that has to be super challenging especially for groups who had contracts um, to perform places because at, as a Portuguese American and being a part of a folklore group like that, um, we're so used to that being what we look forward to on our weekends um, and hanging out with the friends that we're, you know, closest to and grew up with. Um, so it's got, it's got to be hard. It's like not seeing your family, you know, um, so that's got to be challenging. So my hat goes off to all of you guys who are actively a part of a group right now that kind of had to close its doors for the time being and and for the foreseeable future as well. Thank you, Natalia. Rosie, uh, you have to unmute yourself so I do not have any controls for myself. Here we go. Good. Yeah, how Very is the like pandemic that. affecting? Go ahead. Very much what was previously said by both Natalia and David. Um, both group, uh, groups, just in general, the only way they can keep in touch and just kind of keep that connection going is by sharing pictures of memories through previous festas um, or any kind of trips they did, really. Um, you kind of sense like a, like a sense of saudade through this pandemic. There's a lot of uh, longing for us to be able to reconnect again. Um, with uh, bands, I could say I two don't see any kind of activity going on. There's no band practices, nothing like that. But the only way they're really able to keep them going, keep the doors open, is to just do fundraisers by selling food. Thank you. Uh, 
going down the list, I see that uh, Denise is back with us. How has the pandemic affected you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, talk about Zoom crashing at the wrong uh, time here for me. Time. I have no idea right. what happened. Uh, i tell you uh, what we're doing. We're, we're going down the list according to the program, and the next one would be Jose Zidro. How's that? Can you take it from there? Jose Zidro is not with us. Oh, okay. and so, um, but... Uh, We'll, uh, we'll continue with, uh, I don't know what the order was, so uh, yeah. we'll continue with whoever. You have the list there. Eduardo. Yeah, I have the list. Jason Mello? Was... Jason's not with us as well. Okay, 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 okay. I Jose know Luke 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 Joseph Suze. Joseph Suze. Uh, and I yeah. got the guitar right here for him. Yes, okay. <laughs> si, Um Well, like, like David said, um, our folklore group, uh, Mar Altu, has been just completely dormant. Um, mm -hmm. Same as what he said, we have not had a practice since March. Um, like also, like he said, we're keeping communication alive a little bit. We, um, we basically communicate on a WhatsApp text group. And so we'll still text like, uh, people's birthdays on that group or, um, uh, every once in a while, somebody posts something saying that they miss performances or whatever. Somebody might post a picture or something here and there. And everybody answers with the same thing that we all miss it. And we are all, you know, hoping that to get back to it soon but nothing physical, nothing physically has been going on uh, because of the shutdown. Uh, and uh, the same has kind of happened. Uh, as far as Carnaval, I've never been one of the directors of a Carnaval group, so I haven't heard anything yet. But again, also like David, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of assuming that groups are, are already thinking of canceling. Um, but again, I haven't heard anything yet, so I don't know. Um, I know that our Portuguese band, uh, Saint Duvida, we have, of course, everything we've had, all, all of our gigs canceled, but um, one of our horn players, many of you probably know Nicholas, uh, will be getting married uh, this Saturday. And he said, unless, uh, unless the priest completely shuts everything down, he's still having a little wedding. So he's downscaled it and it's, it's got to be outdoors. And it's, I think, only half of the people are invited that what he and his fiance had planned, but we're actually still playing for that. So I'm kind of excited about that. It'll be our first gig since february um and i'm i'm super excited about it um but it's just like really low key and scaled down but it, it it's going to be what it has to be um but yeah everything else has just kind of stopped come to a, a complete halt like i said um our lady of the of the assumption church um we we had to cancel all the cultural part of the festa but they decided that if we still hold mass outside and still have the novenas and everything and the rosaries outside uh, we'd probably be allowed to do it. And we were allowed, or at least our county at least allowed it. And so they still had the Nuvenage started, you know, beginning with rosary every night for nine days and then ended with a, you know, nice mass with several priests present um, all outdoors. So it was, it was still a very nice spiritual event. Uh, just the cultural part was all canceled. Um, but at least it was nice to have kind of the, the spiritual part, but that's it. Eduardo, go ahead and continue because okay. I have no idea who were the, the other oh, young okay, folks who hadn't. Uh, had I'm it, so. muted. No, thank you. Uh, well, the next, the next one was uh, uh, Luis uh, Revelo. Uh, so same with everyone else, uh, especially with the folklore groups. Once uh, Fester started getting canceled, uh, we we had no reason really to start practices. Um, generally, we kind of start about March. Um, and when things first started kind of coming out about everything, um, there was still a little bit uncertainty of severity and everything else. Um, and we had a performance lined up in April. So I was already going through our songs to figure out which ones you didn't have to touch each other with. I was trying to figure something out there, but, uh, the Festa ended up being canceled anyway. Um, but other than that, uh, kind of taken the opportunity to, to take the year off, um, People, I, people enjoy being in the group, but with, I'm sure there is a lot of cases with uh, other groups. They're, they've been involved with the group among other things, and it kind of it takes its toll after a while. And so, having this opportunity to kind of take a year off and kind of recover and uh, re-energize, uh, hopefully for next year, has been nice. Um, I know a lot of groups and organizations have taken the opportunity to kind of still fundraise and everything. Um, do drive through uh, fundraisers, but for us, we've kind of just been sitting pretty and waiting for uh, Feshers to come back so that we can start dancing again. 
I believe people are really anxious for this to start. I, I tell you, they will they will attend anything and everything once this thing opens. Thank you, Tony. How uh, did it affect you? All right. So um, yeah, uh, my Portuguese social life has definitely come to a halt uh, due to this pandemic. Uh, the last time the Portuguese, uh, the Filipino Marco Portuguesa Club got together was January fifth for the uh, Dia de Reis. Obviously, Carnaval uh, was February 21st to the 25th. Um, the uh, Tulare DES uh, Festa, which I was supposed to be president for, um, our last meeting was in March. Um, yeah, it's, it's been a rough year. Um, and, and nothing for any of those organizations that um, I'm part of, nothing has happened. We see a few of you know, our friends um, getting together here and there, hi, hi and bye, how's it going? Um, but as far as an organization, Carnaval, Band, Festa, it's it's all pretty much on hold. Um, we haven't done anything as a group officially as far as what we're going to do with our, our group, um, group Carnaval of Sodiens Lot, uh, what we're going to do for 2021. But um, the writing is kind of on the wall. Here it is almost October and we don't have an assumed, we haven't got together we don't really have an idea of what we would do if something were to open up in February and it just so happens kind of all is earlier next year. Um, and we had planned to even perform a week before that being February 6th and 7th. Um, so it's, it's getting kind of the crunch, down to crunch time. And like David said, and Abel has said, uh, a lot of time and effort goes into kind of all you plan months ahead of time. And, and Louise knows this as well. You start rehearsing, you're spending money on clothes and all those factors, it could still happen, but without a crowd, it's just, it's not cutting the ball. Um, so, it, so. Even when we get to halls with, you know, less people than usual, we, we feel a difference, much less a hall with nobody um, and a camera. So, um, yeah, bands, same thing. Uh, the Ciudad Monca, they've done a few fundraisers um, to try to raise some funds. Actually have a big one coming up this weekend, uh, a golf tournament here in Tulare, uh, which we've had extremely well. Um, support from our community. Um, I'm actually kind of running that tournament and the outpour from the community as far as players and sponsorships has just been great. Uh, so um, our Carnival group, we're not really doing anything festival wise. We're on hold and Fidel Monica waiting to see what happens. Well, thank you. You know, this, uh, our, our title, you know, the Portuguese experience in California certainly is a different experience this year. Our friend Abel Dutra from down south. How how does this affect you, my friend? How you doing, Abel? I'm doing well, too, Eduardo. You look good, my friend. <laughs> Thank you. Don't tell him that. He'll never shut up. <laughs> um, you know, we face the same challenges that many of you are facing. Um, it's it's been a challenge of a year. Um, the, the year started off great for you know for our carnival group. We had a great experience of being able to celebrate carnival for the first time in, in on the island of Teixeira. Uh, but once we came home, we came home to all this craziness and it's affected our community as a whole. Uh, everything is on lockdown. It's affected, uh, you know, the folklore group is pretty much dormant, like many of your folklore groups. Our Philad Monica has, uh, has been struggling to, to, to get together. I know our Mesh de was was looking forward to some of these, uh, some of the uh, openings of, of, of the, of, of the, the Solange but uh, unfortunately, the leadership of the, of the club was uncomfortable as they should have been. And uh, at least uh, have been kind of ex us even being able together to do some sectionals or whatnot. So all of us are anxious, um, you know, to get back. Uh, but it's also given us an opportunity to kind of focus on ourselves and our families, our careers, et cetera. And it's given us an opportunity, at least for myself, to spend a lot more uh, time with the family, which has been a blessing. Um, you know, as far as, you know, communicating with everybody, you know, with technology, and you know, with with your messengers and your WhatsApps and all that. As far as like our our carnival group, we we do keep a, a communication with each other. You know, just to kind of keep each other laughing, etc. But as far as next year carnival, you know, there's nothing much more I can say than what Dave and Antonio has already said. Uh, we're just kind of just waiting to see where we where we stand uh, when this pandemic is, is lifted. Um, but uh, I, I got to give hats off to our community especially the leadership of the Chino Valley DES, you know, they're, you know, they're doing things to keep us afloat and, and to, to do fundraisers with drive throughs in order to, you know, keep us afloat. You know, things are challenging out there, but uh, you know, 
as, you know, we all look to the Holy Spirit for guidance and, and all that. And, uh, and fortunately for our community, we've all stuck together and we'll get through this. You know, we'll all get through this. Challenging, but that's certainly we will. Uh, I believe they're two sisters, Brittany and Brianna. Brianna, is that right? Yeah, Brittany and Brianna. Great. <laughs> um, as far as our group goes, our personal group, our um, group Carnaval, um, Brianna and I performed in Trisada, like I mentioned, in 2019, and that was representing our group. Um, and we performed with a group from Trisada there. And it was a dream for us. Uh, we have gotten a lot of um, new experiences with our group, um, you know, meeting new people in the island. And like someone mentioned before, it just seems like the pandemic, although it's global, has not really affected the Azores as much as it has affected the United States in a sense, as far as cultural you know, in some way it has, but, you know, you still see on social media some smaller uh, festivals or parties or little get togethers that you're not miss that you're not really seeing here. Um, as far as our group, Brianna did have um, an idea uh, to do something virtual and but yeah. that was like in we were just talking brainstorming stuff. How could we do it make it different. Mm -hmm. um, there are ways, uh, especially uh, coming from a public health background, I wouldn't put everyone together, obviously, in a room. Um, but it could, there could be something like this, where if we all have everything, we have everything memorized, and you have your music, musicians, actors, everything, you can make it different and put a little spin on to Carnaval so you don't lose that tradition, uh, especially this year. Yeah, it is different. And I mean, I'm sure that, you know, the island will continue on and maybe in a shorter scale um, or a smaller scale. But for us, you know, it's something we were thinking of before we heard what was going on with Carnaval as far as that. But again, you know, she's due to have her baby very soon. I'm due actually right before Carnaval like around Christmas. So it's kind of um, because we are the inside orders of the group. So it's kind of like up to us on where the group goes from there. But we do want to continue on with the group. It's just um, like everyone has mentioned, the pandemic has taken a toll on everyone, but it has also um, allowed us opportunity to focus on our careers and our school and um, allowed us just to spend other time doing something else, but we have not forgotten about um, our Portuguese community and um, our Carnaval group, which we do want to come back and do something on a smaller level, but we are definitely open to something virtual that still doesn't lose the touch so much of what Carnaval is really about. Because if you think about it, people really enjoy watching playbacks of old Carnaval dances, whether that's on YouTube or like DVDs. And yeah, they're performing on a stage, but now it's kind of like everyone's adapting, whether that's in school or work. Um, we're, for example, we're doing online classes. So I feel like we have to adapt to the times. And um, if people are open to it, they're open to it. If it's only five or three of the, the 20 groups, or I don't even know if we have 20 groups, but whatever that is, I think it's a good idea to kind of keep the momentum going of the Portuguese culture, especially something that is means so much to so many different people. And we'll the bring up the interaction that, that you yeah. missed, right? So yeah, I'm a, I'm a touch and feeling person, so yeah. Zoom, it's it's okay, but it, it doesn't do everything. Yeah. All right, um, Mr. Uh, moderator, we have one more person to answer that question, and then uh, you can take over. And I believe uh, uh, the person missing is uh, Evelyn. Yes, Evelyn. Thank you. Hi. Um, well, the Portuguese American dancers, um, in 2017, we traveled to Portugal. We went to Madeira and to the Azores, had a great time, came back, you know, fundraised again with our huge San Diego community support to plan on going to Hawaii this year. Um, as we all know, there's a big Portuguese community in Hawaii and they were more than happy to host us. Um, we had purchased our tickets um, in the end of February um, for 37 people to go to Honolulu, then to Maui, and then Hilo. 
Um, we were all set up to dance at festivals and as all the other representatives here on this call and, and meeting have mentioned, it all came to a screeching halt with um, the pandemic. Unfortunately, it affected our group financially. We lost about $7,000 because we ended up purchasing really inexpensive flights. Um, and um, even though it was out there that us as a group weren't covering um, insurance, the insurance option was given. And of course, not one person took it because, you know, who wants to pay for that? So unfortunately, we did lose some money. Um, we have not performed since Christmas. And um, we, as a group, have not practiced. Um, we've been hosting monthly events through our UPSCS hall, not the dancers themselves, but the hall has been hosting some drive through food events. Sounds like a lot of other halls are doing the same thing. Um, and so the Portuguese soccer game that's coming up against France on October 11th, um, we will be hosting a dessert booth for the drive through which will be our very first fundraiser that we've had that we've actually come out and, and put some blood, sweat and tears into. Um, we've done some uh, donor letters, which have brought in a little bit of money, um, but um, our adult group, um, is actually having some talks of having some dance practice, which is a little frightful. We haven't really given it a thumbs up. Um, they'd like to perform with four couples at this particular event because they're going to be hosting the soccer game outside in the parking lot in a tent. So they thought, well, four couples with masks, maybe they'll wear their gloves. And uh, they are adults, and I guess they can make that decision upon themselves. But we haven't quite got there. But as we all are very ingrained in our culture. We're all anxious to get back to the norm. And I feel as though I left and moved out of town. That's how, when you see somebody from your community, when you, you know, we are going for your walk maybe, and you see them across the street, it's, it, it's, I mean, we are just social creatures. And I think on top of that, I'm going to, um, pitch Eduardo, you know, we are touchy feely people. It's really hard to see somebody you haven't seen for a long time and want to give them a big hug and two kisses on the cheek. Cause that's just what we do and who we are. So it's, it's affected us just as it's affected all of the groups here throughout California. Thank you, Evelyn. Eduardo, thank you so much for taking over and all of you for uh, kind of uh, you're all experts at this. So you could carry on the conversation with some of the questions that were um, some of the topics we're going to discuss. So thanks a million, Eduardo, for, for doing this. Um, I, I just You're wanted welcome. to, uh, and uh, and sorry, it's uh, technology is what it is. There's a first time for everything. Um, the um, what, what, So I missed a little bit of the first uh, part of the conversation, but you were discussing how it affected your groups um, during the pandemic. So um, we know it's put a stop to the community and we know it's done, you know, I mean, Carnaval, as Tony mentioned, you know, was able to do it last year. It was actually the, the last full thing that the community kind of did. Uh, and then things uh, turned uh, a little bit after that. And so, but um, I wanted to go a little bit beyond that. And it's kind of been a question I, you know, we talked about uh, discussing, but to take a little bit of, a, of a, a different take. So the question I wanted to reflect on is how do you see these groups post pandemic um, with the reality that things will be different? And not just the pandemic will be different. We know, as uh, Evelyn mentioned, that maybe, you know, you have to wear masks to, to dance, you know, or, you know, for a while anyway, or maybe you have to do a few other things. And yesterday with our hall panic, you know, a uh, panel, I should say, a couple of people mentioned something was quite interesting. They feel that nothing will ever be the same. It's like September 11th changed uh, things in, uh, in, in, in the way we move around and so who knows what will be after this pandemic and of course we have somebody uh from the two sisters that does you know public health uh and so could tell a little bit about that but the idea is that uh my question would be in the, in the essence that so things will be different in, in the short term because of the pandemic but uh beyond the pandemic there were issues that we've have had in the portuguese american community that have been creeping up and some of you have talked to, to me about these issues we've talked about it in different forums so what are some of the challenges that the group or your groups that you were involved in, one or the other, that you feel are that they're facing, even if the pandemic didn't hit? What are some of the challenges that the Portuguese community is facing with the groups, with Carnaval, 
with the folklore and with the philharmonicas, you know, concentrating on those three. We know it's extremely hard with a pandemic, but even if that pandemic hadn't hit, what are some of the issues considering a community that's, you know, aging, considering that uh, immigration has basically, for all purposes, ceased, uh, you know, uh, since the 1980s, the beginning of the 1980s. There's a few families here and there, but it's not the exodus that, you know, had us create all these groups that now exist. Uh, that was the immigrants from the 1960s and 70s that created all these groups. So, um, and I think that um, uh, we'll start with Tony because uh, Tony and I have had these conversations in different uh, forums. Um, and so if Tony doesn't mind, he'll be the first one. Uh, how do you feel? What are some of the challenges that the community has, even if we did not have a pandemic and these groups, Tony? Um, in my opinion, and this is strictly my opinion, not something I'm wishing sure. to happen or, or that I have a crystal ball and say is going to happen. Just my opinion, my thoughts. Um, as far as, as Carnaval, um, I, I think the eventual, I won't say death of Carnaval, but um, the, the slow death of Carnaval will be less and less people in the crowds to watch Carnaval. Uh, because you need to understand Portuguese to understand Carnival as it is, as it is presented. Um, if somebody, some, somebody at some time decides they want to do a, a, a English uh, version of Carnival and, and put it on stage, um, that may change things. Uh, but currently being spoken in the Portuguese language, Carnival needs to have Portuguese listeners in the crowd. Um, on the flip side of that, for Filar Monkas, I think it's a little bit different um, because the Philharmonicas are, are finding less and less people interested in playing in the bands, but those that are playing still play to large audiences because there's all ethnicities that listen to our music. Um, so kind of a toss up between the two organizations that, I've, that are, I'm most involved in. Um, kind of all, every year you, you get people that want to join, um, People want to stay involved, but the language is a factor as well for those that are participating. Um, of course, we have you know a bunch of musicians on stage, um, which that's easy to get through, but you still need actors that are going to be able to represent and, and speak the Portuguese words. Um, and uh, that's, like I said, the last few years, what we've seen as far as what has been difficult is the fact that there's less and less crowds, without a doubt, but the same number of halls open um, so that makes it extremely difficult, and David can definitely elaborate on that a little bit, um, because all the halls want to stay open, but we don't have full houses at, at most of them. How's that? Um, so that affects kind of all, um, again, like I said, the Philad Monkas, I think it's just, you know, finding musicians, especially youth, that, that still want to come and be a part of, of what we do in our tradition, because they have so much going on in their lives these days, whether it's sports, dance, uh, church groups, wh whatever. They have a lot, a lot of things on their plate, and, and finding that um, time for, for Portuguese music is, is a strain. So uh, how about a, uh, a young lady? How about uh, Brittany and Brianna? What, uh, both of you, how do you, how do you feel? Um, what are some of the challenges that your group has um, considering even without the pandemic? I mean, uh, first off, when we first started our group uh, in 2018, mm -hmm. uh, we found it very difficult because like Tony mentioned, a lot of people were, f um, they understand Portuguese, but they're fed Portuguese, meaning that they, they know what to say if they're like they're fed they could be fed their lines but they cannot kind of hold mm -hmm. a conversation and in carnaval that kind of works because if we have actors um for example ran and i worked with our actors who are young actors who maybe never even acted in carnaval before uh, but we were able to help feed them their lines and they were able to you know act um, but we did have, um, you know, I would say a key issue was involvement because there are different groups and everyone wants their little, you know, everyone wants their group and everyone wants to have their people and it's just like their own unique little thing. But for us, we've been doing it since we were two years old. And so we've kind of seen it progress, but we've also seen it like a can attest in Terceira is completely different. Um, 
so I feel like in Tercera, everyone's ready to go. Everyone's, um, how would you feel like Tercera was, it's different. It's just it's, different. A, it's an experience. Once you go to Tercera and you're there, it's, it's just a different, a different atmosphere. And like people were talking about, the halls are all full. Yeah, it's completely full. Like if you go somewhere, you will never have an empty hall. And I think- Especially for an island. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I know, how, we don't even know how many, how there's that many people in an island to fill all those halls. It's astonishing. And it's surprising to be honest with you because, um, you know, we don't want to see Carnaval die. And it's like, I, I get the English aspect of it, but then that becomes theater and musical theater. And that's not really what Carnaval is. So that's why we're kind of more on, we'd like to see a virtual or like something different in Carnaval because that opens it up to people who won't necessarily be in the audience, but they'll watch it, whether that's on Facebook, on YouTube. So something along those lines is what I would say. But like, as far as our group goes, um, definitely involvement. And, um, you know, it's hard when they don't know as much Portuguese or, and they want to learn, which is good, but they weren't taught young enough the language or now they have to, you know, catch up, which is nice that they want to be involved. But that's just um, it takes away. It takes away from the experience because you're fed it. And then if you're like in an interview or like you're talking to a grandparent or like a parent who only speaks Portuguese, that's hard because then you cannot keep a conversation. So that's I feel like um, what our Portuguese community is doing really well now uh, that we've seen on social media is a lot of Portuguese learning, whether that's Brazilian Portuguese, Azorian Portuguese, or European Portuguese. That's really really good in this time because everything's virtual so it doesn't give anyone an excuse like i can't go i can't do this so that's that's something really good and positive that we've seen um from this pandemic but with with the, without the pandemic i think involvement is always a big thing whether that's in folklore band or carnival and anyone evelyn what are some of the challenges even without the pandemic that the portuguese american dancers that have been around since 1948 uh which we're facing uh, from your perspective um we don't really have i mean we have a lot of community support and i think um when when we start to have kind of you know i don't think we really have that many issues because we had so many kids join the group that we had to split it in two i think what we do here in san diego and we were portuguese american dancers the woman who established our group mary manise was very proud to be an American you know she came here probably in the 30s or 20s I don't know when she came um, she was very old um, so she really encouraged um, just participation she you know when of course once you start a group you can't have the authentic costumes and the fabrics and all of the into windows and the shoes and the socks because it, it as we all know it's quite expensive so it's because we're such an established group we've we've made it to that point to where we have the costumes even for the junior group of course we don't have all the shoes they outgrow them in five minutes but we try our best to be as authentic as possible but that's because we're an established group and we have generations of of families that now their grandkids are in the group so they will support us you know grandparents are good you know they're great for fundraisers you know if they have a grandkid in the group they're they're willing to to step up um with my sister Therese garces and i um with the junior group you know there's a working parents you know and they might work 30 minutes away from you know the portuguese hall um that makes it challenging i think working parents makes it challenging for our junior group but we do a good job of trying to arrange on that day to have, you know, maybe grandma or grandpa can pick them up or their auntie can, you know, they can get dropped off after school over there. And my sister and I will go pick up kids and we try and make it fun. You know, sometimes dance practice can get pretty intense. We all know that, it, you know, we get frustrated. People aren't listening. They're talking too much. It becomes a social hour. So we do make time. Um, at the end or the beginning of the practice, I see this with the adult group is because they practice in my backyard at times. Um, they'll come in and they get to business and they're really focused and, and having, you know, an intense practice, but they allow time to have fun. 
Let but me I, ask you a question, Evelyn. But your group, Tony mentioned something about yeah, the with the Carnaval, which is, of course, different from the folklore. Uh, the lack of the Portuguese language that Brittany and Brianna mentioned as well, they don't know. But your group, uh, the uh, the last time I saw it, most of your your group dances. So in other words, the music is been is on playback, as we call it in Portuguese. So it's pre-recorded music, correct? Okay. You don't have to worry. You don't have to worry about the singing or the uh, musicians. Correct. Um, okay. We do have recorded music from our, our original band, which was right. the Point Strings, who are no longer with us. So um, we never. Um, had like live music it was always real to real at the beginning of time that does make it much easier but we don't have a problem filling our hall but you know down in southern california there's only chino artesia and san diego so those that that's a big area of, mm -hmm. of space and people want who who love their portuguese culture will will make arrangements to sure sure but that's that's one way to maybe that the some groups may have to look at what you've been doing all these years. Uh, I sure hope Denise is not asking me a question. <laughs> Maybe he lost connection again. Well, I'm going to weigh in on the point yeah, right, that you're saying. So. Nobody minds. We got Denise going again. I'm going to chime in and follow go up ahead, go with, ahead, go, go with ahead. what Evelyn was saying. Um, go ahead, Natalia. Go ahead. I think that to her point about having, you know, only three groups at the radius that they do, you know, is huge because here in the Bay Area, I mean, at one point we had. I don't know, four to five groups within a 20 to 30 mile radius, which is insane. Um, because, I mean, there's a lot of Portuguese people, but there's only so many young, interested Portuguese kids to go around, you know? Um, so I think that keeping the young people engaged has always been challenging um, and keeping it fun, of course. Um, so that that's huge. And then I also think that it's important to, for us as Portuguese to not only target Portuguese communities. Um, I know uh, our fat, our fat de Portuguesa. When we were in our prime, we did most of our uh, performances for non-Portuguese communities, for birthday parties, for anniversary parties, and these were people that, you know, maybe. Maybe we're already, you know, fourth and fifth generation Portuguese. Us all that are on this call, luckily we're first, second or third, but that's just not going to be around anymore. Um, I mean, we're lucky if we find somebody that's fourth or fifth generation Portuguese who's young and wants to remain engaged and, you know, continue to practice the, the Portuguese tradition. So I think that it's important to try and keep it as fun as you can and try to engage the young um, population, but I will say too that it makes it challenging when there are so many groups within such a close radius. Uh, that is a really, really hard thing. I don't dance Carnaval, but being that like there's literally seven Carnaval groups, I feel like in San Jose has to be like really, really hard um, because just for folklore alone, just with having four to five, four to five groups within, you know, from San Leandro all the way to San Jose and in between um, was very challenging, so. Yeah. Thank you, who would like to tackle the same question? I got a note from Denise, pass it around to the next person. Go ahead. Who's gonna go next? David? Sure, I'll go. Um, you know, just building up on what everybody else has said, the, the past struggles that we've been having is the lack of participation. Um, and, and when you add the pandemic on top of that, I think um, it's going to put some strain on some groups, on, on some organization. I mean, let's be real. Uh, the groups that were struggling before the pandemic are going to be hit the hardest. Uh, I know Luige mentioned, oh, it's good to have a break. Yeah, it is great to have a break. But those breaks sometimes are very hard to come out of and can make or break that group. 
Uh, I've seen I've seen it happen. I'm I'm an example of it. That's how I stopped playing music. I took a seven month break. I was like, wow, there's a whole other life out there. I'm not going back, and I didn't. Uh, and this was an aspect to the band. And so the lack of participation has been something that we've been seeing over and over. I think these bands that have 80 musicians aren't going to struggle as much to start up again than those that had 20 and struggled to have those 20. Same thing with the folklore groups. You have groups that have 30 plus members in it. The chances are going to be pretty good that they're going to come back, but those that were only dependent on four or five couples are probably going to struggle. The other aspect too is these organizations are being hit really hard financially. Uh, more of the Mandaj and some of these bands who have halls that they have to pay for. Granted that they're doing drive-by sopage and bifanish, but they're going to have to pay, they're going to have to make a lot of bifanish to be able to pay some of those loans that they still have. And so once we're going, once we open up and go back to a somewhat normal life, they might, they might be strained and not have those funds to be able to put on the events that they used to before. So yeah, they, there's just so many aspects that are going to affect a lot, a lot of our culture because of this. There is a lot of, there's a lot of incognitos. There is a lot of uh, who knows what, you know, but uh, as you mentioned, you know, the Bifana's um, takeouts and the SOPA's delivery and all of that, they become creative, you know, uh, and uh, I'm sure that these groups will have to become creative under the new, uh, uh, under the new. Uh, it new is a very, it is a very creative, and anything helps. Yeah. But we need to be real, realistic too. You yeah. know, yeah. A sale of the finish yeah. is isn't is not going to cover your electric bill for the most. Yeah. Well, um, f fortunately, I think the ones that didn't be finished, they don't have an electric bill. But that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> hey, David. Thank you. Okay, what's to go next on the that yeah. same question? I'll, uh, I'll jump in. Um, go, ahead, go ahead, Abel. You know, when it comes to, you know, to, to piggyback on some of what people are saying, and I think uh, in the challenges that we faced prior to the pandemic, um, you know, let's start with Philharmonicus, for example, you know, down here in the, in the Chino area, you know, we play, you know, practices are challenging, you know, to get to practice, well, there's so many different activities that are, are, are available to all of us, that it makes it difficult to be committed to you know to the band or so many different variations and and in chino we only have about maybe 16 performances throughout the year and and i've been involved in fiat monitors for geez nearly 30 years and and i've gotten to know so many people throughout the state and i know other bands that are out there mind you there's only 14 fiat monicas but there's got to be about what 40 50 festers maybe give or take i don't know the exact number but all those festas rely on these philharmonicas to perform at their festas. And that burns people out, you know, and I know there are philharmonicas out there who play two, three times a weekend, you know, and they, they have their whole weekend shop for philharmonicas. And, that, and, and I see that as a huge challenge because it doesn't really, you know, enlighten people to want to be a part of the band. Uh, and especially the way we are today and the lives that we lead, it does, it's hard. It's much more challenging. Um, if you look at Carnaval, for example, you know, the big wave of the immigration that came that really kind of ignited Carnaval in California is in the mid seventies. And those were people that my, you know, people like my parents that came in here and they brought a lot of those traditions and they came up here and, you know, they came out, they did really well. They did really strong. They had their children in a, in a, in a completely different, society than what they were brought up and they did a great job in instilling those cultures the the those cultures and in uh, people such as myself and, and many of you on this panel today uh but you know but things have evolved so much uh so much more that things are, are much more challenging to move forward uh to the point of you know the portuguese speaking um uh of, and on how that relates to you know to, uh, being on stage you know, I had the honor of being in Carnaval in Tsheda this year. And one thing I can honestly say, you cannot compare Carnaval in Tsheda to Carnaval in California. It's completely different. And to that token, if you look at the festers that we have today in California and, you know, just not only in California, but in other states and communities throughout the U.S. and Canada, they already, you know, they're not celebrating the festers as they do in Tsheda today. They have, you know, Tsheda has evolved in a way. And we're still really stuck in the past. 
where it might be okay in order for us to keep our traditions going. It might be okay to, you know, infuse a little bit of American culture to it as well. You know, you know, I, and I know some people may not like that, um, you know, being someone that has been actively involved in, 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 in ensuring that we stick with the Portuguese cult language and everything that we do. But if we want it to survive moving forward, we may have to think outside the box, but make, ensure that we still keep the flavor of Carnaval, uh, but a little bit of an American twist. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a debate that's going to go on forever. Uh, it's going to go on for a long time. I know someone at some point may stab, like Tony said, of doing an American dance. Uh, could it be unjust? I don't know. It depends on how tasteful it could be. Who knows? But all I do know is we have to kind of think outside of the box a little bit if we want to ensure that our our culture stay. If you look at, I think it, in the panel yesterday, someone was talking about the Polacks and how 20 years ago it was a big, uh, it, you know, big communities, the languages and all that stuff. And nowadays, they're, they're, you know, they're nearly obsolete. Uh, you know, I feel from a Portuguese community standpoint, we're pretty strong. I don't see anybody that has the community centers that we have. You know, and, and from that aspect, we're very prideful in what we have, but we have to be cognizant of what our surroundings are and where we live and maybe consolidate some stuff. Um, I, you know, I don't know, uh, but there are, but we have opportunities to, to, to change things for the better um, and in order to, to keep things going. But I think the major challenges that we have is, is the participation, not only from the people involved, but people that are coming to watch from a kind of all standpoint, as Tony said. And I think the, the biggest aspect from a Fidel Monica standpoint, I just think there's too many fish there's, and then and bands are just, are getting burned out. And I, and I don't want to disrespect a lot of the, all the halls out there. I get it, but it's a lot. And, and, it, and it's hard for everybody to keep that on their schedule and live a balanced life. Well, there's about a hundred halls in California, yeah. California, and not all of them, uh, have an opportunity to have a band because there aren't bands for everybody. Uh, now you mentioned that things change, of course, and uh, the experience is not the same as to say it or Portugal, what have you. We have a gentleman talking about the Portuguese in Macau where they have three languages in one sentence, you know, Chinese, English, and Portuguese. And, uh, you know, I came from Algarve just about uh, oh, three days ago and I think there are five languages in one sentence because of the influence from the outside. So, you know, there are changes, there are adaptions, and, uh, but as long as we have the flavor, remember the title of it is The Portuguese American Experience in California, not necessarily is doing exactly like they did or they continue to do. As long as we have the flavor, I think we're happy with that. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next one that was to tackle that question. Yeah, I, I wanted to jump on that, uh, oh. what Abel was saying. I I 100% agree with that. That's definitely um, how I've been seeing lately. We we need to learn to kind of adapt and evolve and think outside the box with a lot of our uh, current, not necessarily the traditions themselves, but how we present them, how we involve others in them. And I think you're seeing that with certain organizations, certain events who are starting to do that, you're seeing more uh, involvement, you're seeing more attendance than some who are still kind of holding on to these old ways from 30, 40 years ago, and then wondering why, why things are dwindling for them. Um, I think that's going to be a big proponent for how we move forward, or how we kind of maintain a lot of the popular traditions in our communities. Um, and it, it, it just comes to that is how do we how do we make this more accessible? How do we make this more interesting? And that's um, kind of on that with our group. Um, one thing since I kind of took over is uh, that I've always tried. My, my motto is how do I make this cool? How do I make this fun? Um, you know, for our generation, even for some of our parents generation, doing folklore, for example, was one of the only things they could do or one of the only things available to them. Uh, but now there's so many things out there that, you know, younger uh, people can get involved in. And how do you convince them to put on wool clothing and go walk out in 90 degree weather on a Saturday, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of been the struggle is how do you make these certain uh, cultural activities fun? How do you make them cool? How do you make them popular? 
And I think that's where kind of a younger, a younger group has to come in and say, Hey, this is, yeah, you got to do this, but there's all these other kind of aspects to it. There's social aspects to it that people enjoy. And I think that's kind of one of the big things. And then with, with the language, I, that's, I think that's the other kind of big uh, obstacle we have as a community is people are no longer, you know, you don't speak Portuguese to your kids and that's understandable. You know, you, uh, you Americanize here, you speak English more. I know I have, uh, as I've gotten older, I still try to maintain my Portuguese, still try to learn and uh, interact with the, you know, organizations and the events, but it's tough. And I think that's one of the things is, how are we going to teach people Portuguese or younger generations Portuguese when we don't have those kind of first generation uh, uh, environments? And not every community has a Portuguese class, Portuguese school. Uh, here in Tulare, um, we're pretty blessed to have Portuguese in high school. Um, and we have the Portuguese uh, class for K through eight until then. But some communities don't have that, uh, that opportunity. And so I think one thing we have to think about is how do we teach Portuguese in those organizations? Like uh, I think Tony mentioned before, uh, Portuguese bands a little easier to get non-Portuguese people or not people that are so in tune with the language and everything involved because at the heart of it, you're just playing music and a lot of people like to play music. And so it comes down to how do you kind of teach Portuguese in between the lines there? I think that is going to be a big kind of a, uh, uh, solution that we need to come together on if we're going to end up maintaining like a Naval. A Naval is very reliant on the language. Um, and so for that to survive as we would like it and to kind of stave off the English, um, Englishing it, uh, so to speak, there's kind of be a way that we have to introduce Portuguese to the general public, to the new generation without it being uh, kind of the old tactics. Um, I kind of have hope. I know uh, David mentioned, you know, the break. Uh, sometimes it's it, it's tough to come back from. I know it's going to be tough um, uh, for me, uh, but I'm hoping that once things come back to normal, you're going to have a lot of people kind of yearning for those activities, yearning for those uh, organizations that they miss during the break and coming back with a new energy and maybe some new ideas. I hope my hope is that the organizations right now that are taking, uh, you know, that are taking this time to kind of rethink, retool what, how they involve themselves with the community, how they uh, recruit more members, more involvement. Um, and that when we do come back, we're kind of stronger than ever. I know you'll have a few people that say, you know what, it was nice to have my Sunday mornings to myself, but I'm hoping that you'll have some people that said, you know, that was rough not having all that going on. And I really want to come back and uh, rejoin. And so I'm kind of hopeful for now for the future, but I know I understand that there's the struggles, there's the obstacles in our way, but I'm hopeful that we have a lot of smart and uh, adaptive people in our communities. And I, I have strong faith that we'll be able to kind of get strong as we go forward. Thank you, Luis. I know you mentioned Portuguese and the Portuguese language. You know, one of the reasons for this these conferences to start was precisely to, pro to promote the Portuguese teaching, you know, in particular at the elementary and the secondary level. And, uh, you know, during the heyday of bilingual education, uh, there was a lot of, uh, uh, there was a lot of, you know, Portuguese courses being offered. There's a lot less now, but fortunately there's still some high schools where they offer Portuguese. At one time, there were none, you know, and I, um, I've been here a few, a few years long well according to Denise I've been here since the time of Moses but don't believe him and and <laughs> there were no Portuguese courses at the elementary secondary level and we had some and then we lost some uh and but I'm not the person that is an expert on that that's Denise Borges at least back hi Denise you want to take over yeah yeah this is not so uh, this is not very good continue <laughs> okay No, I guess uh, Denise uh, still has some uh, difficult with uh, with this uh, with this uh, this Zoom, I guess, for lack of a better word. We're about at the an hour and a half, so we're almost uh, at the end. And uh, I know that Denise wanted me to ask you, uh, what do you suggest for the future as a topic uh, for us to talk about before we wrap it up? 
Anyone wants to uh, make a contribution? And Denise, can you hear us okay? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes? Yeah. Go ahead, Joe. Joe. Just, uh, one just thing that I, that is, one thing that is very related to uh, to what we've been talking about, um, especially the last couple of, of panelists here have been have been sharing um, how what we do is very related to the local Portuguese festas, um, and so uh, something that I think would be neat to to discuss uh, to like envelop to to develop more is you know the future of of the festas. Maybe it'd be neat to have. Um, to have a discussion with some of the of the the presidents and past presidents of of Portuguese festivals throughout the state of California, and see you know what they think, how how it's grown, how it's changed, uh, how they expect it to change. Um, you know the the festivals, like we all said, have very much to do with what we do. You know, I mean, uh, our dance groups, our marching bands, our carnaval, they perform at these Portuguese halls that were set up by. Uh, Holy Spirit societies by by Portuguese Catholic churches by um, or Portuguese fraternal societies or whatever, exactly. and what's the future of those? What how are those going? Or I don't know. That'd be a neat a neat question. I think. I I believe I think you're right on something that we've been talking about a lot is to have a meeting of those people. But someone has suggested, so I don't know if that's being my my word, to bring the younger people that are involved to get the halls. You listen from them, and some halls have. Young directors, some unfortunately don't. So, what is that they see the future of the hall? That's a good, a good topic, and I uh, we should explore that. Anybody else wants to uh, bring in some other ideas? I don't know if I can be heard. Oh, yeah, can be heard. Yes, you can. Okay, good. Uh, so, um, uh, sorry about all the all the. I have no idea, but anyway, that's technology. Um, my, my, my concern as we come up to an end and I didn't hear the second part, but I, I was able to connect with my phone a little bit through, uh, through Facebook and hear what you were saying. And so, um, as we come up on the end, as Eduardo said, um, and uh, if, uh, if there aren't any other comments, I'd like to ask each and every one of you, if you could look, uh, at what you've discussed here tonight at your organizations and some of the challenges, some of the opportunities. Um, as you know, Tony mentioned some of the pertinent uh, elements that I heard. And also, you know, Abel said, you know, maybe we can make some changes. And Brianna and Brittany said, you know, maybe we can use a little bit more technology, which is what we're trying to do when it works. Um, the idea is, um, what are a couple of action items in your thoughts that you would like to see, because most of you or all, just about all of you uh, are younger uh, of the younger generation. The future of the community is basically in your hands as leaders in whatever organization group that you are involved. I mean, you are the future. So um, my question to you would be, what are a couple of action items? And uh, Joseph, into your response, what you said about the, we discussed that a little bit yesterday with the, with the 11 halls that we had. Uh, and there were some great ideas from San Diego having, for example, a Portuguese market in it, which is, you know, something that not a lot of halls have, uh, to uh, Newark uh, using their parking lot uh, as, uh, you know, to bring in revenue because they're next to high tech companies that need a place for their employees to park. So they have no use for a parking lot during the day, uh, Monday through Friday. So they're using it, you know, that's a way to bring in uh, some uh, some revenue because that allows you to do other things. So uh, we've discussed that with the halls and actually I think we've started a good dialogue, but when you, within your groups, within the dilemmas of the Portuguese language, because that is an issue as, uh, as it was mentioned by some of you, it's uh, the issue is there are, and Brittany and uh, Brianna brought up, you know, some of the younger actors don't feel, you know, that they their Portuguese is enough that they want to, you know, express themselves, you know, in, in, in on stage. But then I I ask, I have another issue that I think is is concerning for Carnaval is what a, even if we and we do have like Tony said. It's totally different than it was 30 years ago, especially the people playing musical instruments and the involvement of the young people. It's great. However, uh, dancing especially. However, we also need people to watch, you know. And so uh, the the I, I used to go to the Carnival 
uh, and I still go. And when I went and I was like, I'm 61, when I went and I was 45 and I was the youngest person, you know, I thought it was kind of cool. But, you know, when I go at 61, I'm still a young guy. You know, uh, uh, there's a lot of people in their 70s and 80s watching it. Uh, it, it, it is an issue. Uh, and so um, this issue of the language continues. So my thought is this, my question to you is this, how do we, I mean, what are one or two action items that you would like to see within the Portuguese American community that within your group or working with other groups, what is one or two action items that you think would help us move forward in the community, you know, forgetting about the pandemic because hopefully next year at this time, we'll all be uh, healthy and uh, uh, somewhat of a new normality. So what are one or two action items that you would like to see that would help your group or would help the community in general? If it's something that you don't feel is good for you, but you'd like to see in the community as, at all, at large. Any thoughts on that? Anyone would like to start? Tony's, oh, Evelyn, good. Folklore, um, looking at folklore, this wouldn't apply to Carnival because unless you start changing the language to English, but incorporating Portuguese traditions in your shows is one thing that we've done is our particular Portuguese neighborhood is is dwindling. I mean, we have less and less Portuguese coming into our community. So what we have decided, and this is, Natalia, you mentioned it as well, is you really need to share our culture with other people, with Americans. They love everything Portuguese. They think we are the neatest thing. Um, we're fun. We're loving. We, you know, most of them don't even know who their cousins are or as one of my daughter's friends said, I think I have one cousin. We all started laughing in the room. Who has one cousin, <laughs> you know? So I mean, sharing our culture with other cultures is what I think is gonna move us forward. Indeed, and that's a very good point because if we look historically at ethnic groups, those who have survived have mainstreamed the culture. So with the culture, the, the culture, the foods, everything has been mainstreamed into the culture. Everybody goes and eats at an Italian restaurant, not just Italian people. Um, everybody, um, so if you can, the only way for us to survive past no immigration is indeed to mainstream the culture, indeed. David, I think you were gonna go next. Uh, yeah, just to build on what Evelyn said, I think uh, San Diego is a perfect example of how integrated their community is with the American community. Uh, I've, I've attended their festa and the whole city seems to be involved in that festa, which is amazing. And you can't really say that for any of the other halls of, throughout California. And, you know, we're a rich culture. We've got a lot of great things, but we're also very closed and into a bubble. And we've had this discussion before. Um, one thing that I have seen in the past with other organizations that help them survive, and Evelyn again brought this up with the market, I had no idea that they had a market at the hall, but I think if these organizations start being run as businesses, rather than donating their time consistently where you, you know, bartenders, I was part of a, of a, of a board of director where you had to bartend every weekend and everything was donated and you lived and breathed in that in that organization and you get burned out but I think if you start thinking of it as a corporation as an actual business and you know if you, what's the point of having this huge hall that you use once a week why don't you rent spaces use it as a business to generate money and to generate that finance to be able to maintain yourselves and I think that will not burn out people as much as it has been in these last couple of years because I can speak, when I was president of the band, I could not wait for the year to be over <laughs> because it, you get burnt out and you, your life ends up revolving around that organization. And especially like some of us that are on this, you're involved in the band, you're involved in folklore, you're involved in Carnaval. Your life is the Portuguese community. You have no other time for anything else other than all of, all of the things that you're involved in. You get overwhelmed. Any other thoughts? If I can just chime in here for a second. Um, as far as um, Carnival, um, one one idea that uh, could throw be thrown at all the groups in California would say, hey, you know what? Let's take a year, either we as adults take a year off or incorporate 
with the adults NASA, and some groups have already done this, bringing in a, a kids group. Um, I, I will speak from a personal um, experience back in 2005 when my children were very young. Um, for three, four years, um, I, I kept a, a kids group and there was years that we performed with them and there was years that we took a year off and, and put our energy into getting them on stage and getting them to carry on the, the tradition. And Tulare currently has three, three groups and I have members from those kids dancers in all three groups. And that's a, a little bit of, of a pride thing for me. I, I'm proud of that because I think that I contributed to carrying on a little bit of the kind of all tradition in, in our area. And I think if every group um, maybe focused on a year to say, we're gonna do it for with kids this year. And a few groups have already done that, uh, but it would, it, it would carry the tradition on a little bit longer. They're gonna learn those words, those Portuguese words as Brianna and Brittany said, they're going to be fed those words, um, but sometimes those words will stick in their heads or those songs will stick in their heads and the next year they want to do it again. And that's, that's keeping our culture alive. Um, other than performing to other ethnicities at other events, um, there's not really a whole lot that Carnaval can do to change and open up uh, because it is our culture in Carnaval involves the Portuguese language. Um, so I think we, we, we kind of have to work from within with children, with youth to give it more years of longevity than if we don't, if we keep continue to do with the same groups that we have, which every one of them has their, their place. If you bring the kids in and keep that group going, last year there was, I want to say three youth groups um, in Canaval, uh, and that's great, but then there will go four or five years with none. And then you'll see the gaps and, and already with some of the existing adult groups, you see those gaps of the same faces year after year and you don't see any, any new kids coming in. So I think for Carnival, um, definitely getting the youth involved will, will help um, maintain the culture and tradition. Anyone else? Natalia. Yeah, yeah I'm gonna chime in. Um, I think it goes without saying that us as Portuguese are very proud people. Um, pride sometimes get, gets a, leads us to competition, um, which is unfortunate because we, at the end of the day, we all have really one goal, right? It's to continue our Portuguese traditions to the best of our abilities, whether it be Philharmonica, you know, folklore or the Sesh Carnival or whatever it may be. Um, whether it be cuisine, who knows? Um, I think that a takeaway from it is to remain as humble as we can and, you know, to, you know, almost like the you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours type of thing. Being that there's so many different halls, I think, Smurozev, you mentioned that there's, you know, a hundred plus throughout California. Um, I think it, it, it may be beneficial in the future um, for some of these uh, groups or halls to join together and host, you know, events together at one place, you know, this month and then the, the other place in the next couple of months or whatever, so that both instead of split splitting um, the attendees um, and having a festa the same weekend within 15 miles away from each other, I think that it would benefit the revenue of both locations um, and, and grow the whole community closer together. Um, so I think that that's very important um, to take a look at as well is to, you know, be, be kind and try and uh, be helpful with, you know, engaging other, other people from other groups. I think that that's huge as well. Thank you, indeed. Any other thoughts on that? Any other action items that you think might help? Um, yeah, if I could join in a little bit. Uh, I think in terms of that kind of idea of involving others and kind of promoting ourselves to a bigger community. Um, one thing we've kind of tried to do for folklore is, you know, perform at, um, I, and I know another, a lot of groups have done this better, um, is, you know, folk festivals, you know, you have a lot of different, uh, different kind of communities that are at those events and the uh, Portuguese uh, heritage, like uh, sports games, they do for football, they've done soccer and for baseball, you have a lot of these groups of form and you kind of get new eyes on uh, specifically folklore groups uh, in this respect. Um, and I think pushing our groups to kind of 
do those kind of events really helps. Um, it's like you said, you kind of mainstream to the culture, which we, we really need. Um, and then in terms of, you know, getting youth involved, Tony was talking about, you know, trying to promote those uh, kids groups for Kona Vault. And I wonder why can't halls and other organizations like that, um, generally you see kind of these, these, uh, these board of directors that are, you know, older um, uh, at an age, but why not have kind of a, a youth board for some of these organizations for a festival, for example, um, where, you know, they're in charge of certain part of the festival where, you know, more of kind of aimed at the youth and you get a good way of getting them involved in kind of, um, in volunteering, but also kind of get uh, a good way to get youth more in, uh, interested in attending these events. Indeed. That's a good that's a, a, a good move. Any others? Okay. Well, um, then I think that uh, we're going to call it a wrap. We've been at this, uh, or you've been at this for an hour and 40 minutes. I've been at this uh, an hour and 40 minutes off and on. Uh, and uh, uh, But uh, thank you all very much. Um, uh, the discussion was great. I the, what I missed, I was uh, able to put it on Facebook and, and follow it. Uh, that's a great thing about that uh, that aspect of it is that Zoom continued even though I wasn't there because Eduardo was also a host and so is uh, Bernice. And so um, thank you all um, in, in the future. So you see uh, one quick round real quick in about a minute or two, if you can. Uh, future's bright for Portuguese American culture in California, D David. It is if we all fight for it. Okay, Luis. Yeah, I agree. I think I'm hopeful. We got a lot of smart young people coming up and I, I can't wait to see what, what happens in the future. Fantastic. Joseph. Uh, I'm kind of hopeful that uh, this little break, um, kind of like somebody said earlier, kind of uh, allow us to kind of refill our batteries and uh, and I'm hoping that that the so dodge that somebody else mentioned earlier will come alive, um, and people will be excited uh, to come back to to festas, to dance practices, to bands, to everything. Um, I know I'm excited. My my group members say that they're excited. So I'm kind of hoping that as things start opening up, there'll be a whole new excitement and and motivation and energy behind all of this. Next. I, uh, I, agree, I agree with Joseph. I think uh, once this thing opens up, you know our Portuguese community, we're gonna be tripping over ourselves to get to a hall, to get some sopas, to go see a dance of Carnaval, to go hear a Philharmonica. Um, I hope that this ends soon, because as anything else, the longer, the longer without, the longer it is to, the, longer, the harder it is to get restarted. So I think there is hope. Um, I think the, uh, the soldat, uh, that's a very good word for this, will will bring us back together as a community um and, and there'll be some fresh the startups and hopefully we come back strong stronger than ever oh yeah yeah absolutely i think that everybody should just continue to try and be supportive um to their uh outside groups or groups that they're not involved in as possible so that we you know we can come back stronger than ever like tony was saying and i, I have no doubt that 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 would ha will happen Evelyn. i agree with the group i have no doubt we're portuguese we're proud and i think we're going to come out of this stronger than ever and i hope that our youth which is our future um continue in our footsteps and think of something new and are more improved. They have to be, you know, get their marketing skills in place here and, and really share our culture with everyone. Bill. Yeah, I agree with the panel. Um, you know, we have a very rich culture and and uh, I know our community has missed out, had that sold out, especially with no bullfights this year. And, and I think once this kind of comes back, you might see some new faces that haven't been around in a while come back. So looking forward to things opening up and, and that's getting back to uh, to doing what we enjoy doing. Brianna and Brittany. Uh, I think that you know, with all this going on, there's a a big future for the Portuguese community, um, especially you know we're a minority and people forget that. 
Um, so I think we just need to be all united as a culture and a race. Um, not just saying that we're proud and just keep saying that. Uh, there has to be a lot of action behind the words. Yeah, and I think if we have initiative and just continue this beyond the panel, um, that a lot can happen, and that people really recognize the Portuguese community, not just within our community, but within a broader scale, um, whether that's in Portuguese being engineers, lawyers, doctors, um, where, wherever the Portuguese culture goes and that individual takes that culture, that's always a part of them. But I definitely feel like um, there's a lot of potential if we're I all think united. It's a, yeah, I think it's important that we're united and um, branch out a lot, um, especially in the community where uh, we see always, you know, the Portuguese people just doing the same things over and over again. So I think we need to branch out in other aspects, um, especially in education, and that will help promote the Portuguese community um, throughout, yeah, throughout the years. Rosie. My hope is that we just um, kind of take this time as a way to recharge our battery and come out of it um, full of energy and wanting to come back together as a stronger community and wanting to help out each other, like help all the halls in our area. One other observation I'd like to have a few of you comments or uh, all of you if you'd like. Um, is this time, it's been six months since the pandemic hit, um, more than likely you'll be at least two or three more. Uh, if, for those of you who uh, are here in the Central Valley, uh, we just discussed this yesterday, the uh, Tulare Ag uh, Expo, which is a big thing, it's called the Farm Show here in Tulare, uh, was just canceled. It's an event that's in February and um, it actually affects one of our organizations a lot, TVS. Um, and so it looks like a lot of things are going to be um, still in a pandemic mode, at least for another three months or so. So it may be a whole year you know, of this. Have we used this time uh, so far in your organizations? Have you used it? Have you seen this time being used in the community to, to actually do what all of you said we should do, which is to reflect and recharge? Or have we just sat? What have you, has been your observations? I think we've actually just been sitting, at least from my end. I was going to say, I think it's the sitting one. <laughs> We're all sitting right now, right? <laughs> I, I, I agree that we've been sitting, but I think it's the, the, the fact of the unknown of, of what's going on, how long this is going to last. It, it's hard to plan for something in February when here we are six months down the road and, and nothing has really changed. and. There's no leadership and it's, it's kind of confusing times for everybody, but especially when you're in charge of an organization that involves so many people and, and is based solely on a culture, it's hard to, uh, to, to recharge right now because you don't know. But I just hope this serves as a lesson. Um, that's kind of what I want to say in closing. And I hope this serves as a lesson to the youth. Um, so they, they, they get a feel of what it's been like for these last six months, not seeing each other, not going to bullfights, not playing music, not doing kind of all, not doing folklore, not doing the things that your forefathers and your parents and your grandparents brought over. And you can't do it for six months. How are you going to react? It's a challenge. It's a challenge. And I hope it is, uh, they come out of it stronger um, and, and hungrier to embrace our roots. Yeah, and I think it's important for us to be sensitive to, to, I mean, I think all of us are under different types of stress um, during the unprecedented time. So you don't know your neighbor's story, you know, and, you know, somebody who at one point could have been really involved and volunteered all, their, all of their time uh, now no longer has a job or something like that. So I think that it's important, um, like I think Brianna and um, Brittany said, you know, to all come together and conjoin and support one each other um, is very important moving forward um, to get us back on track to where we need to be. Um, if I can just piggyback. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've been sitting and been focusing on myself, but I, I really have to commend 
uh, those who are in the leadership roles in the community, in the community halls throughout the state that are doing what they can to, to stay afloat with all what, with their hard work and dedication and thinking outside the box with the, with the drive-throughs and their small fundraisers too. So to those people, thank you for doing what you're doing and doing your part to keep your, your community afloat. And once we get through this, I look forward to us all, you know, having the opportunity to get back and, and do what we can to keep things going. Brittany and Brianna, you had your- Yeah, I just wanna say that um, we are talking about the Portuguese community and we've all talked in English. So it's a little bit ironic <laughs> that us as panelists didn't really talk in Portuguese, but we have so many people watching. And I think that it's important to recognize that we are in the United States of America during a time that is, so unprecedented and um and we can't be complacent of that meaning that november is coming and i think it's important for us as portuguese americans to really be educated and vote because that's going to matter especially when this pandemic is over if we're looking at the future and uh the future of our portuguese community um, is all reliant on the future of the United States because that is where we are now. Um, although we love Portugal, Madeira, I, all the Portuguese culture abroad, uh, we need to remember that uh, we need to focus on America so we can get all of us through these times after. So I just wanna say that it's really, really important to do our parts as Portuguese Americans, uh, first generation, second and so forth, to really uh, make educated votes on who we want our next candidates to be and not to take a political stance, but to really, really take our initiatives as leaders um, in our Portuguese community to really pass that on to our groups and our friends and family to really, really research um, what's going on in our government. And as Portuguese Americans, we can really truly make a difference. And the census just went out. That was a big political thing that the Portuguese, you know, we're a part of. And so I think that November is coming up and we should really, really be educated and vote and do our parts as Americans, especially Portuguese Americans. So that's it. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> I, I, I want to just answer a little bit what, um, not answer, but kind of uh, reflect on what Brittany is, and, and Brianna said. I always said, uh, Brianna's on this side, Brittany's on this side. So um, the, uh, the, Indeed, it's kind of ironic. I mean, I'm I, I'm a Portuguese language teacher. That's what I do for a living. What I did for a living, and I do this, and I still do part time uh, at a college level. Um, the issue why do it in English was to reach obviously a much bigger audience. Um, the reality is this: there are this is the reality. These are facts. We can say you know our halls are filled or our halls are empty, but the you know facts are facts. The reality is we have three. According to the last census, okay, we have three hundred and fifty thousand. For, uh, people in the state of California that identify as being Portuguese Americans. You know, we always say, oh, there's a million of us. Well, the reality is there's 350. We can't say there's a million because or we can't, you know, we can say that there's whatever the numbers tell us is what we have. And the numbers tell us that we have 350,000. That same census tells us this in this other fact, uh, you know, and one of the reasons why these conferences have been done mostly in English. Uh, when they're present, it's different because we can obviously break up some things. Um, the, they're, according to the same census, of the 350, only 31,000 said they still spoke some Portuguese at home, some. So that can be anything from a full conversation, as I know some of you are can do, uh, or probably most of you on this panel here, or but or to just what a lot of Portuguese Americans can say, which is you know calaboca, you know uh, to use you know Luigi's podcast, uh, calaboca or fecha porta or you know uh, call me callet, uh, and so um, the uh, so that's some Portuguese. That means that three hundred and twenty thousand. Amer Californians of Portuguese background don't speak Portuguese, but still identify to speak Portuguese. So we could, we're going to have to make some decisions also in the future um, when we go forward. You know how how much of, you know how much of a purists do we want to be? You know, do we want to only cater to you know 
25,000, which is probably more likely now than it was 10 years ago? Uh, or do we want to reach, you know, or can we do with technology, which can be done? Obviously, the things, you know, a little bit more bilingual. Um, but there, that, is a, that is a good issue that you brought up. It is a very good issue because as a Portuguese language teacher, I find myself speaking in English and I prefer it the other way around. Um, it's the language of my life. It's the language I write in and everything else, but it is what it is. Um, and that, that's something that we have to discuss, but it's something also that we have to also look at the mainstream. And I would, and I would, and I, and I was, you know, elated to hear all of you say that we really do need to get into more of the mainstream because unless things change in Portugal and there's new immigration, in the next 10 or 15 years. And we all don't want that because that would mean there was a calamity in Portugal. We want Portugal and those islands to prosper. We want people to stay in their land. It's not the easiest thing in the world to immigrate, okay? Um, and so um, I think that if we don't want that, if we want Portugal to prosper, the Azores, Madeira, then obviously there's gonna be less and less immigrants. Um, and so, you know, a couple of families here and there. And so without the new immigrants, we need to make sure that the second and third and fourth generations keep on being Portuguese, even if they don't speak it. We want to make sure that they keep on being as Portuguese as they can. And we have to mainstream into that, into, into that world. I, I, that's my own uh, thought on that. And I, and I think that all of you agree with that. For example, folklore, uh, as Luis said, you know, a lot more on the um, folk uh, uh, festivals. And, and why not have the Festival of Folklore at Disneyland where everybody can see it? not bad idea today but you know but in the future why not have the band festival also at uh, at uh, great america in san jose you know where you have maybe a hundred thousand people that are going to see it as well so these are some of the things that we of course will need to continue uh the, the talking about and yesterday with the panel uh, and hopefully we can continue with that as well uh, many of the panelists got a hold of me this morning um and wanted us to continue this kind of a dialogue. So I've suggested to the chairman of the board of the Luzo American Education Foundation that with the resources uh, of the Luzo American Education Foundation and the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute, that maybe we could have community town halls, okay, um, on, a, on a maybe every five or six week basis, okay, that we could bring people together to discuss these issues and to look at points, not just now, but also even when we get back into the, 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 the you know, the Festa mode, we still are gonna have to continue to, to, to this dialogue, I believe in the post pandemic. So if there are, thank you all very much. I'd like to ask Bernice, uh, Brittany, go ahead and the bell. No, just goodbye, okay. Uh, so uh, Bernice. Well, in closing, I don't wanna take up too much time. I just wanted to thank everybody for participating and sharing their challenges and their thoughts for the future. We do have some challenges ahead of us, not only after the pandemic, but just in, in general to uh, promote our culture. And uh, I guess a common theme is also involving young people and uh, communicating. And I think you're all in a, in a great place to do that. And I look forward to, to the future with you guys too. So thank you again for your participation and uh, that's it. <laughs> thank you everyone again. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your service. Thank you for those of you who are involved in the gazillion things and still find time uh, to live a normal life. Um, uh, thanks to, uh, uh, you probably, the break was probably a good thing for those of you who are involved in so many things, but thanks for all of your contributions to the Portuguese American community. The community could not do it without bright, uh, intelligent and empathetic, uh, caring and socially responsible, as Brittany said, uh, young people such as yourself. So thank you all very much. Kudos to all you do. You're all icons. You're all leaders in the Portuguese American community in one way or another. And I'm thankful. The Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute is thankful. And certainly the Lewis American Education Foundation is thankful as well. And I, I would like to add much. one more thing. Thank you, Denise, for, for organizing this. This has been a great mm -hmm. opportunity for everybody to share their ideas and be an innovator. So thank you for doing this. Thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate yeah. it. Take care. Yeah. Stay safe, yeah. everyone. Bon noite. Bon noite. Thank you. Bon noite. Boa noite. Boa noite. Boa noite. Tchau, tchau. Boa noite. Adeus. Até à próxima. Um abraço. Boa noite. Até à próxima. Adeusinho. Boa noite.